I was inspired to found Build My SOP because I was a manager running these facilities for many years and the Achilles heel I've seen in every business that I've entered has always been their standard operating procedures and their employee training. Build My SOP offers document management, learning management, and task management for our business owners and our managers. We're a really easy platform to be able to navigate and to be able to track and keep revisions of all of the changes that you've made within the years of your facility being open. And the plants don't stop growing and retail stores don't stop selling. And so it's very challenging to keep up with this when you're also having to get product out of the door at the end of the day. People should sign up with Build My SOP right now because regulations are in place right now. Regulations are going to be in place in the future and things are going to be evolving and changing as long as this industry is here. We're really a vendor that people can trust. We're helping people with their bottom line, um, creating homogenized products, creating employee accountability, and just um, you know helping them with that peace of mind at the end of the day. Hi guys. Hey Katie. Hi. Hi Katie, how are you? Glad to I'm be here. So excited. Awesome. More excited than anyone should be about uh, SOPs, but <laughs> that's what I do. How are you guys all doing? Good. good. Really good. Awesome. Glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. I am thrilled um, to have you all joining me. Hello to everyone out there on the interwebs. Uh, just a little bit about what we're doing today. We are uh, introducing our branded SOP collaboration initiative to the public for the first time. And what we've done is we've gathered the industry experts in certain what we refer to as categories at Build My SOP. Um, and so with us today, we have uh, Chris Lowe with Twister and Kirtan. Uh, we have David Van Eaton. Is that, did I say it right? Von, Von yeah. Eaton or Van Eaton? No, it's Van. <laughs> okay, Van Eaton. I was right the first time. Thank you. Um, David Van Eaton with Bovida. And then we have John Hartzell with Dispot. So thanks everybody for joining me. Um, what we've done is we have really gotten together and talked about the full pre-harvest to post-harvest initiative and what we know as experts within our fields. And we have come up with beautiful SOPs that we will be releasing to the public on September, I believe 15th or 17th. I will keep you on your toes on that one. Um, and so I'll let everybody introduce themselves. And Chris, you can start off and just give us a little bit about your background and what you guys do over at Kirtan. Yeah, so uh, I actually have been involved with the company since about 2005, um, but more or less in the backgrounds, I officially joined them about three years ago. Um, but my primary background is from heavy industry. So I've you know been around transport, energy, production, uh, all sorts of different uh, process oriented companies, project management. And what I've found is like when it, when it came over to cannabis, uh, uh, it a lot of it translated. A lot of the same struggles that we see in, in cannabis operation facilities, we see in all sorts of other industries. And um, it's nice to see some of these uh, expertises coming from um, other areas into the space. So, uh, you know, my primary passion um, is around building things. And so here at Kirton, you know, we really look at everything from the time that uh, the plant is cut down right to, you know, it meets John at packaging. Um, you know, that's really our niche. Uh, so we're, we're really a solution provider that started from, you know, people saying that they got a real labor problem, uh, you know, trying to cut leaves off cannabis. So it started with trimmers and it's kind of ballooned up from there. And we can get into uh, more of the different products uh, later on. I love it. The evolution of the industry. And it's nice to know that other industries have, you know, similar struggles because sometimes it can feel like, what am I doing in cannabis? And it can be a little overwhelming. And it's nice to know that there are just general struggles that you have um, in those. So thanks. All right, David, let's let's have you introduce yourself. Um, I'm David Van Eaton. I'm the <clears throat> senior brand manager for Bovida. Uh, Bovida is a global two-way humidity control system uh, company that uh, we sell basically humidity control packs for, we got our start in cigar actually in the 90s and oddly enough cannabis is like the newest product so after cigars we were in musical instruments so we would have humidity packs that preserve you know wooden uh, instruments like guitars violins and then now here we are in cannabis so that's what we do <laughs> that's really cool i didn't even think about the instruments but i do i i remember seeing humidity packs in there but oh yeah for sure 
Hi, John. Hi there. How you doing, Katie? I'm good. I'm really good. good. Hey, thanks for the invitation. And so glad to be covering the southern part of the accent gamut with what I hear a little bit of something in the north out of Chris. Uh, so my name is John Hartzell. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders at Dispo. Uh, we like to say instead of Dispot. Like oh, sorry. Info. No, that's okay. We don't mind the double entendre of it all. And uh, we certainly do smoke quite a lot of pot around our place. I know that the team is back in, in Phoenix now streaming this live. Hi, everybody in the zoo and the bullpen. Uh, glad to be uh, seeing you here. Um, Dispo is a branding and packaging company that formed uh, uh, about seven years ago. It's an industry-born organization. Uh, we have decades and decades of experience in the cannabis industry, both uh, in the legacy market and the continuing uh, legal commercial market, and uh, really uh, uh, take a lot of pride in the fact that we focus our efforts uh, primarily on uh, the cannabis industry and now oncoming the psychedelics industry. So looking forward to a really productive conversation today. Uh-oh. It happens. Uh, I've used uh, their place in this industry as well. Looking forward to a great conversation. Us too, John. Thank you. Well, um, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Katie Cravens with Build My SOP, and we focus on standard operating procedures in the cannabis industry and other regulated businesses and just general businesses. Uh, so I have a passion for sharing processes and not just processes, but the right way to do things, the safe way to do things, uh, the way that we can keep doing things, scale those things. Um, I've learned quite a bit in my last nine years in the industry, starting off as a janitor in a cannabis uh, cultivation facility and working my way up to one of the top directors uh, for a big national brand that we all know and love. So um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. We'll get into one of our first categories that we came up with for standard operating procedures that we will be sharing with the public. And this is all about harvest and drying. And Chris, this is totally your world. So. There's a lot of things that we do before harvest to prepare for that, that can really help us with even, I mean, taking a bunch of fan leaves off, right, before we, we get into the actual cutting from the meristem. Um, let's kind of start with a little bit of pre-harvest stuff that you've seen on your end that really helps during the harvest phase, and then we can go into the harvest phase itself. Yeah, absolutely. And and you really you hit the nail on the head right off the bat is, you know, defoliation in the last couple of weeks of uh, flowering is so important um, when it comes to processing, uh, because, you know, right after it gets harvested and you're hang drying plants, if you are hang drying full plant, um, you know, all that foliation is hanging over a lot of the flowers and, and you're not going to get as uniform of a dry uh, in that room with a lot of heavy fan leaves. So, um, you know, when you go through in the last two weeks, getting those fan leaves off as much as possible gives you a, a more dense flower down below, uh, a, a much better product, makes um, mechanical processing or machine processing that much easier, that more effective, and that closer to like a, a hand trimmed aesthetic uh, down the road too. So yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough how important that is in, in the, the post harvest. And um, we actually, you know, have that as one of our key components is our proven process for for automated uh, processing is really, you know, making sure that you get that uh, done in the last two weeks of flower. And we have a question from Jeremy, which is also, you know, perfect timing. Jeremy, thank you. Um, to flush or not to flush? That is the question. And is 6060 ideal for a 710 day dry? So for flush or not to flush, I'm going to be the first to, uh, to admit that it, at Twister and everybody, we are not going to influence growing. Uh, you know, we're really the post harvest guys and uh, everybody has their secret sauce in growing and i've heard good things about flushing and not flushing um there's some a lot of bro science around it so i'm not gonna even jump into the the to the to the flush or not flush but what i will say is 60 60 is our, part of our proven process i mean that is the best possible way to get a, a nice slow uh, uh 
uh, dry so that you're going to get the ability to uh, get a, a good product out the door. Um, and but what, what I really have to emphasize when you do that 60-60 is that you really, really got to make sure that you've got a, a really homogenous uh, moisture and temperature throughout the room and that you're watching the moisture of those flowers really, really closely so that you're not going to over dry because once you over dry, you are toast. Uh, one tip that we all offer to some of the, the cultivators that are processing is that when you're drying uh, and you think you're getting close to that that point where you're going to stop the dry and pull it out and harvest is that you're going to turn off all your uh, your dehumidification in your AC and let the room settle if you can up to 24 hours but closely monitor the moisture in that room and so that you can see if it's going to the moisture starting to shoot up a lot really quickly you're going to have to turn those systems back on but if you notice that it's let stabilized out and you're not seeing much change you're kind of right in that right spot so and then as far as uh bud wash after a fresh harvest uh i i haven't been you know that privy to to a lot of bud wash i've seen it done a lot of a few times but it, it's not one of the things we get into we see i mean we'll we have machinery and equipment that'll do a wet harvest but you know we're we're recommending for the product quality and the best possible product that's going to a customer that you steer your processes towards dry, uh, hang dry and through. Great recommendation. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about harvesting and some legalities around the actual term of harvest. And this is from a build my SOP perspective, and then we'll get into actual the harvest itself. So not a lot of people know that to actually harvest a plant, which is defined as cutting the meristem from its medium, its growing medium, rock well, you know, cocoa, soil, water, you know, whatever you're using. If you're removing it from that medium, you actually have to have your annual worker protection standards training up to date or your three year pesticide application license up to date. Someone with a three-year application license within your facility can conduct, as long as it's you know up to date, they can conduct that annual worker protection standard training to you and your employees in your facility. But a lot of people are totally flabbergasted when I let them know that task requires a specific training legally. And if you're working with the Department of Agriculture, which all of us as cultivators are because we are working with commercial agriculture, um, then this, this is a requirement. So that's just something that I wanted to let the public know with the opportunity today. And then Chris, I just kind of wanted to talk to you about that harvest process. I've seen harvested, harvesting done in so many different ways. Um, besides the defoliating, which you know we've already talked about, what else can we do during that harvest process to set us up for the rest? Yeah, so the, the success, I mean, like, uh, like you, I've seen, you know, hundreds of cultivation facilities uh, what we found is is the minimal handling so if you're able to take a full plant down and get it on a hanger right away and get it into that dry room with a lot with uh, the minimal amount of destemming debranching um, you know really at, at that stage uh, trichome heads are so delicate so like uh, I hear a lot around hand versus machine uh, processing later uh, Every time you're handling uh, any sort of flour, you're crushing trichrome heads, right? And all that oil is lost as soon as you, and you can see it on, on operators when they have their gloves, you know, and they're doing any sort of processing, those things. Yeah, I mean, they, they basically become green mitts at the end of the end of the, uh, the, the shift. So, you know, as much as yeah, you can limit. Yeah, well, that's it's exactly it, right? Your gloves home because yeah. they were making hash out of their, yeah. We have legacy roots too, and and that was one of the one of the perks to those people that are in those rooms. Uh, you know, they would get to keep the gloves yeah. afterwards, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, minimizing the amount of handle that you have uh, between the time that you cut it down um, to the time you get into your dry room, um, a, a huge uh, benefit too. Uh, is having your dry room really close to where you're going to process it afterwards. So you're not changing humidities, um, you know, between different locations that you're processing. So, you know, and, and having the foresight uh, to build your facility or lay your facility out in a, in a way that it's sequential, almost like a production line. So you've got it from, you know, from the flower room, you're going, you know, very close to a, a dry area, and then you're going right to a processing area where you're not having those huge variations in temperature and humidity. Um, so that, that's a huge benefit and, and something that we're 
learning and retroactively putting into some of the other places that we're consulting on is that, hey, make sure this all makes sense. Yeah. Don't have your wash bay right next to your dry room because, you know, you're going to get these. Hello. Yeah. Oh, hey, hey, you'd be surprised. But I mean, oh, I would not be surprised. I've seen I always am so disappointed when I get in there just right after the builder got in there or just after they approved things with, you know, the state. And I'm like, why would your storage closet be that small? How much weed are you planning on growing? That doesn't fit there. Like, it's just little things like that. But I mean, it's because really they're yeah. thinking about, you know, if it's a pre existing building that they're having to re, you know, just kind of reuse. Okay, plumbing's already there. So we're going to set that up here and here. You know, Katie, I was just going to jump in real quick while, while we're on this part of the conversation. Yeah, Come on in. You know, uh, Chris brings up a really good point. You know, when, when you walk into a new cultivation or to uh, a cultivation that's been operating for a long time, this group has been in so many of those types of facilities that you can start to immediately understand, hey, are they meeting compliance? Are they really following SOPs? Does the owner uh, of this business or, or the co compliance officer at this business have things to be concerned about that they're not aware of? Um, having partners like our organizations to your facility, to your grow, to your uh, business operations, uh, for somebody that's new to the industry really can be helpful. I know I've had that experience and I'm sure that Chris and others here have as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, a huge part of what we do um, is trying to offer that service with our customers. Like, yeah, we have the equipment. Yeah, that's part of it. But if you don't get the, the process right, and, and, you know, goes goes really back to, you know, why we love the tie to, to build my SOP.com is like, here's the, the blueprint to do it right. You can choose to deviate from there and, and make, you know, compromises, but that's going to impact your consistency, your throughput, um, your <clears throat> regulatory compliance. Like it has this, a lot of spinoff, uh, you know, issues that come with, you know, straying from something that works. It all starts the, from the foundation, Every, you know, everything, even our, our physical bodies do. So I, same thing with business, you know, from the ground up. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about pre-harvest and some of the, you know, trichome sensitivity and handling of the plant. Let's talk a little bit about post-harvest, drying. Um, David, too, you're more than welcome to kind of hop into this if you have any anything to say about dry room conditions and things like that. Um, I don't, actually. I mean, like, that's very okay. um, specific to the cultivation. And by the way, I just want to let you know, I use Twitter twist the trimmers all the time every harvest so i mean like we're i've been using them for years so quality quality machines you guys made there but. Well, i appreciate this shout out yeah <laughs> we we pride ourselves on trying to make the best and and do the best but uh, uh katie do you want me to, to do go jump onto the dry side too absolutely um, yeah no that's that's your guys's category yeah you know uh so there is a lot of so the, the industry is in its infancy. There's a lot of different chefs that have different ways of doing things. And, you know, we're not going to be the first to claim that, you know, what we recommend is going to be the best and only way. It's a good way and we know it works. Um, but yeah, we're, we're not exclusive to, to the only way. So what we find is really that, you know, as, as the question stated, is that 60, 60, um, 60 percent humidity in the room and then, you know, 60 degrees Fahrenheit um, for our American friends. Um, and uh, so once you get into that spot and you're monitored correctly, like I've seen it done a lot warmer for a lot shorter period of time. Um, but what we find is for terpene preservation, because those uh, monoterpenes are fairly sensitive. To, to temperature and so if you dry them out really quickly you're gonna you're gonna evaporate them off so in the higher temperatures um, the uh, amount of, of drying will obviously vary from harvest to harvest so like that's one of the future areas of, of exploration I think that everybody um, is really interested to see how the data comes back and I know a lot of people are doing uh, it is a little bit uh, cloak and dagger in the cannabis industry so like you know there's stuff that works in other locations and that doesn't necessarily spread because everybody's in that race to, to get to the top uh, so but what I'm finding as as this tough time um, in the cannabis industry is starting to get a little bit better that you know that information sharing is starting to loosen up a lot of the facilities are saying yeah I don't mind him coming in to take a look and see how you know we do things because I'm, th I'm sure we can learn other things from each other and and one of those big uh, areas is around drying uh, because, you know, a huge 
there's so much harvests that are won or lost in the dry um mm -hmm. you know if if you're not drying correctly you open up for uh molds or or other types of uh you know contaminants that you don't really want in your product um you, you could have to in canada you know we don't see this as much in the u.s but there's a lot of irradiation because you know they just can't be bothered with dealing with the sanitization portion of it or you know they're not ready to you know change the way that their dry rooms are set up because you know when they were put together they were a wet drive facility so they were, you know, bucking and trimming everything and then putting it on trays and then rolling trays into rooms. Well, those tray, those rooms may not be conducive to full plant hang drying. So, you know, there's still a lot of norming uh, that, that come out. And I think it, it really depends on the operator and the facility. Um, although we can offer a standardized, uh, you know, way of doing it. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, good knowledge still to come out of the industry in, in the drying section. Absolutely. And post drying, I have seen so many methods of trimming. I have spent at least $10,000 hand trimming one harvest uh, again and again and again, watching operators do that. So, and, and then there's all those problems too, right? Bringing in outside, uh, outside people into your facility for possible contamination. Um, one, of my, uh, one of my nicknames, which I hold dearly, is Wicked Witch of Weed. Um, I, you know, unless you have a child or, or some type of an emergency going on, I really like to keep phones out of my, out of my trim room. I'm not going to fail an E. coli test because you took your phone into the bathroom. I really don't give a, I really don't give a shit what music you're going to listen to today. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, you know, so I, I earned the name, I get it, but, um, there's little tiny things like that. So many different variables that can literally take away months and months of work um and and honestly some people's livelihoods and their ability to even operate again the next day um so those are those are some of the concerns in post harvest and then you know also we've got a lot of automation and things coming our way that you know we've had some time now to really experience the plant and and learn how to deal with these these trichomes and these terpenes and all of those other things and i want to i want you to kind of highlight a little bit on how twister helps to do that in post harvest Sure. Uh, and it's funny that you bring this up because it's been the age all old question for us and, and, you know, pr pretty much the precipice of why this company is here is, you know, all these people did it by hand at a time and now we're introducing machines of whatever sort uh and throughout the process and you know i you know i guess at one time you know there was people that were only crushing grapes with their feet and then the pundits would say that oh it just doesn't taste the same unless people are crushing it with their feet or you know uh you know there's just not the same amount of alcohol effect and then i guess the reality is that you know the, you really have to focus on, on the customer and you know what is the customer telling you? What 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 are they willing to uh, to appreciate or or what do they value? And and I think if you look at any uh, commercial business, you know that will transition from manual labor. Um, it's inevitable when you you scale or, or you're for profit. Um, you know you, you really have to to you know make the cost of goods sold um, low as you know, possible while maintaining the quality you need to do. So like, you know, I've, I've yet to go into a dispensary that says, oh, this is the line for hand trim and this is the line for machine trim. Like, I mean, it just doesn't exist. And, you know, when we do side-by-side -side pictures and I see a lot of other manufacturers and, you know, producers um, send those pictures out there, there's, there's, it's not 100% unilateral, which one is done by a machine and which was done by hand and which one is done with the other process or something like that. So, you know, I think that the, the customer appetite for it will start to, you know, show that, you know, they really just want good product at a good price um, that's going to have a good smell, a good color, um, a good taste uh, and, and is not too sharp on their on their palate. Uh, and so, you know, we've seen you know numbers and numbers of studies and 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 tests where you know we've seen the actual machine uh cannabis uh you know through machine trimmed actually have a higher thc level than hand trimmed and you know there's there's a number of reasons that you know that account for that where you know the machines are taking the low thc material off the outside so you're getting a, a higher trichome density of, of the sample to you know like just like we were talking about earlier where you know every time they're handling unless they're taking a stock and hand you know scissoring off the stock which doesn't happen a lot uh they're handling the the the, the flower and they're basically crushing trichomes on the outside as they're trimming it so you know there's 
what you're finding is that the the brokers of the past that were taking these these bags and saying this is machine trimmed and creating this artificial grading value we're probably going to see less and less of that um because you know it's it's an, uh, a business and you know through everybody's fully aware that you know cannabis is in a, a little bit of an economic trough you know a lot of the the companies that are were, were surviving on that that high dollar per pound uh, value uh, and that's dropped are kind of gone away. So like, you know, the nice part about the industry is that they're, it's a very resilient bunch, a very enthusiastic bunch and that they, you know, they're, they are feeding their families with this business and they are going to find better and more efficient ways to, to put that product out to the market. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, you're going to see even more and, it, and automation isn't, we're like replacing people it's not like oh robots are there and people are gone you know there's high value stuff that people are going to do that isn't going to be sitting there with scissors you know in trim jail they're they're going to be oh people. trim jail i got asked one time <laughs> one time and i told my boss don't ever ask me to do that again that'll be the last time you see me i just yeah. i have i have neck issues and stuff too but i mean it really is physically pretty i and i have so much respect for trimmers people that can pull five six pounds out in a day i could never do that unfortunately i saw trimmers get treated really shitty in facilities again yeah. and again and i was told by trim crews like because i would make sure that they had lunch i would make sure that they had their 15 minute breaks at the a lot of times i would make sure that i i mean that we have certain legal obligations to to actually have nice working conditions for them and things like that right but for a lot of years those trimmers were working under really hard rough conditions and really not given the the respect that they deserve you know what and and that's exactly it like you now we, instead of this monotonous carpal tunnel syndrome you know seat that they have you know now we're able to like create the opportunity for them to move to other parts like they don't have to leave the industry they can go to defoliation they can go into other parts of the process they can you know get more creative they can find different better ways to do things as opposed to just sitting there and hacking it out with scissors so you know that that's one of the definite advantages of, of automation is that you know just like ai is revolutionizing the way you know some content gets cr produced uh, as far as you know the the chat gpt and doing base content it, it looks like it's been written by a computer. There's still going to be that that uh, that aspect that people are, are part of. I mean, it's that that human touch that still needs to get added to it. That applies to physical and you know written uh, parts of, of businesses. Right? Yeah. Honey Smith says crazy trimmer stories. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I bet. Well, so after the trim's done. We're done with our, our twister and we're going into the curing phase. This David, is the, yeah. Well, yeah. Or if you, do you mind if I touch on it no, quickly? No, I want both of you Sorry. guys to kind of touch on this. I want this to be a conversation because drying, curing, like it, you know, it all just how curing and packaging is going to kind of overlay. Well, so the reason I am enthusiastic is we have a new product that, that that's come out that we are really excited about we just started shipping um it's called the cure puck and what we found is that the data is changing the way about how we look, um uh, process to make sure that those gases are coming off um and so like david uh, uh um has mentioned before you know we were on um that you know having that that layer on the outside of uh of of the trichomes and the THC is so important. So this is kind of where I'll I'll back out because I, I got excited. <laughs> David had going. Yeah, no, no, it's, your enthusiasm is awesome. I feel the same way. I'm sorry. What did you say? I want David to extend a little more on that two way. Yeah, yeah. So you know, first of all, yeah, your enthusiasm is awesome. I feel the same way. I mean, that's why I love my job. So. Um, yeah, so humidity control is extremely important and you want to definitely make sure that your humidity levels don't get too high or too low. Um, mold will form or, you know, your, your flower just will be too dry either way. One of the common things we see in commercial facilities is they will harvest a ton of flour in a day and then they'll throw it into totes and then that's it. There is no curing process. So while these companies are trying to get their product into dispensaries to market, it's always a great idea if you can throw a boba to pack in there. Um, we recommend for more <clears throat> humid states, like a 58% RH for more uh, dry states, 62%. But, you know, since a lot of these commercial facilities don't really cure, 
and it's just sitting in the bag. A lot of them will say, well, it's curing while it's in the bag. Uh, but, you know, there is no off gassing going on or burping or anything like that. So it's, you know, what we are working on right now is really trying to, to you know, dial that science in and try to create a product that will help with that uh, curing regimen. So Can you define curing? Yeah, well, essentially what's going on is uh, you know, your plant is degrading as you put it in a storage container, it, you know, right after you harvest and dry it, that's just part of it. And then you want to cure it correctly. And what it leads to is like a smoother smoke. Um, it also like, you know, reduces harshness. It brings out the potency and the flavors of the uh, flower. But essentially your plant's dying, all the chloroform is being released, it's a, sugars are evaporating. That's where the burping comes into play where you're opening a jar or a turkey bag or whatever to get those gases out, replace it with fresh air. Um, a lot of people have hygrometers in their storage containers to try to find out what the right humidity level is. We have been playing around with as low as 50 RH, but um, we obviously right now recommend 55 to 65. Um, and you know, right that as you do that, you you basically are off gassing for the first week, a little bit less the second week, and then you leave it alone for another week or longer, and then you know it kind of ages, breaks down, and everything settles into place, and that's when you get great flower. So that's curing. I mean, but as we were talking about earlier. There is no definitive curing method. I mean, like there's a lot of people out there who do a lot of different things. I mentioned the commercial facilities where they'll just throw it in a tote bag and then transport it to the next way. It's still doing its thing while it's in that container. But um, that's where our product comes in to try to at least maintain the humidity levels so it's not degrading at the wrong rate. And then you still have fresh flour when you get to it's in, you know, to the dispensary essentially. Um, in the home grow market, it's the exact same thing. You know, you have a lot of people who take a lot of pride in their cannabis that they cultivate at home and they want to make the best product. It's just like fine wine. You know, it has to age just the right way. You often hear stories about people who are like, I'm growing my weed for Christmas right now, you know, and they're going to have their special strain. So, you know, you definitely want to treat it um, all the way through. I mean, harvest is a huge part of it, but then it keeps going after that. So that's, that's our stance on curing. And, you know, to Chris's point, like you want to protect the trichomes. Our product creates a monolayer around the trichomes, which is just a water barrier. And oftentimes you might hear, uh, we hear in the community sometimes, well, oh, Boboda steals your terpenes. You know, one of our taglines is save the terps. So we're not trying to destroy or steal terpenes. We're mainly just trying to protect the terpenes with a water barrier. So then what you'll oftentimes find is, as you protect those terpenes, you know, it lasts longer, it stays fresher. Then when you grind it up, that's when the water barrier breaks and you smell that aroma like times 10. So we have a thing called the Boveda challenge we do where we'll ask you to take two jars, one with Boveda, one without, put flour in there, seal them up for a month, take them out and then try them both and see which is more fresh or more potent. You know, the aroma is, is there. So have you guys done the Boveda challenge? <laughs> Probably not. We haven't really like done that for a while, but we you use we, we our sales people definitely challenge. do that when they go over to commercial facilities. So, yeah, I I, I have unofficially done the Bovida <laughs> challenge because I have quite a lot of Bovida product in my canna door oh, that yeah. my uh, business partner got for me, and I'm using Bovida products to maintain the freshness of the multiple different kinds of flour uh, that I try to keep on hand. I commonly tell our customers we can't uh, really package a product that we haven't product tested around our place. So we we have a lot of samples floating around. I hope you guys can make it by and maybe smoke some <laughs> with us. That'd be nice, man. Awesome. But yeah, um, maintaining the potency is super important. And you mentioned Canador. That's it's interesting because Boveda's um, start came from the cigar world. And oftentimes, I mean, like I make that correlation all the time because when I started working for Boba, I've only ever known it as a grower and I've only ever known it as a cannabis product. But to find out that they've been around for 20 plus years doing cigar, you know, preservation, they're in every humidor in the country. So, and if you look at it, it's like, well, look, if you're spinning, a cigar is an incredible product. It takes years. When you go into a cigar shop, you spend whatever on a cigar. It's a huge bargain because you're getting a cigar. It might cost you like 14 bucks. That cigar took maybe eight years to land in your hand, you know, and along the way, I mean, like that 
they're doing many different steps in the, their curing process. And then, of course, they stress you put it in a humidor to maintain the humidity levels to preserve the oils and the tobacco. And it's no different from cannabis. Like you have to make that same mindset. And when you mention Canador, it's funny because I have one of those too. And um, you put your flower in there and you you want to definitely take good care of it and store it and make sure that it maintains its freshness and uh, aroma. So I also heard uh, this is a little off topic, but I, and I apologize, but I heard you guys are working on temperature or humidity controls for concentrates. We are. <laughs> um, that's really all I can uh, say right now. I'm not we're we're working on a few different things. So the edible, like the gummy area, is something that we're focused on, um, but also concentrates. Um, to your point, because you know, those have terpenes as well and you want to protect those. So yes, that's, that's hopefully something that's coming sometime in the near future. Cool. Very cool. Chris, did you want to say anything more about how CurePec, uh, Cure, you know, you know, Cure Puck, Puck, yeah, you, you know, it, it works with yeah. Bovida, like curing in general, um, you know, we found that the customer just gets a better product and, and, you know, that's really what we're focused on, um, right now is making sure that, you know, not only is it as inexpensive to produce as possible, but also that we're delivering the best possible, um, product to, to the customer. So like when you're curing it properly, you're getting like a better, uh, nose in the bag, you're getting a, a, a squishier, uh, but not something that's a rock hard and dust in the end. Like when you cure it properly and you put it in a bag and then add a, a bovida with or without a bovida, but with a bovida, it's better. But even without, you're getting a better result. And then you're extending the shelf life. You add a bovida and it gets even longer after that. So, you know, it's just a, a crucial step that, that you know, in some cases, uh, you know, in the legacy world, it's like, hey, get turn and burn, get it out as quickly as right. possible. Now that we're in a different legal framework in a lot of places, it's time to up the game, right? Well, yeah, there's a lot more competition. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot more bigger players, a lot more automation, and you kind of got to, you've kind of got to grab and hold on to that, uh, technology and figure out how to, uh, live with it or, or let it drown you. And that's just the way of the world, um, even outside of cannabis. So, uh, let's talk a little bit. You said something about shelf life and this is, oh, such a topic in our, in our space here. Um. I, you know, I've been in facilities where we've had products on our shelf in a cultivation facility for nine or 10 months before it then gets into being sold or processed or whatever that is. So let's talk a little bit about shelf life. Let's talk a little bit how, you know, some some of your products can help extend that shelf life. And really, I what is the cutoff? <laughs> it's really... It's really up to the person that has the weed, to be honest with you. Right. Um, we, uh, you know, our whole thing is a lot of people, and especially in these new emerging markets, like they don't know, they don't even think about like, how do I maintain this? In my mind, it's like, if you're going to a dispensary and you're throwing down, I don't know how much, it varies from state to state. I'm in Colorado, so here you're gonna pay for an ounce around 130 bucks. So if you're gonna spend that much money on flour, you're gonna wanna preserve it, you know? and and even in an illicit state where you maybe don't get your hands on flour as often as you like, so you buy, you get however much of the strain you can. I might never see, you know, purple paralysis again. Lucky I've got to have it. Exactly. I feel like I've got lucky charms. I'm like, give all of it to me. Right. So then you want to definitely maintain and preserve your flour, you know, and that's where we come in. And as I mentioned, 58 and 62 RH is where we're at. And it's very simple. I mean, you just literally take but a bottle of you want that in your vault. You want that in yeah. your in, in you, your, the room that you're storing your product in. So when I walk well, into retail stores that are storing product and they don't have any type of controls in that storage. Right. You see that a lot, right. Especially hard. in Colorado, unfortunately, but um, it is, it well, is hard. You guys go through such drastic changes when it comes yeah. to humidity and dryness. I mean, you guys can be dead dry for months and then all of a sudden have like three feet of snow. It's true. That's why it's important to maintain that control. So our Boveda packs work like we have like a size one, four, eight, and then we have something called a 67 and a 320. So one is for like, you know, literally like a like a quarter, you know, and then um, the size four is probably our most common. That'll hold around half an ounce. And then an eight will hold an ounce plus. 
and then a 67 will hold a pound and up and up. So essentially you just throw it in a jar, bag, whatever you store your flour in, as long as it's airtight. Um, our product is a salt water solution. It's like 98% biodegradable. Um, you throw the pack in there. You don't open it up and dump it out or anything like that. You literally just throw the pack in there. And then um, it does its job. It may, it, it's a two-way humidity control. So it adds and it gives away to maintain that proper RH. And then um, you know it's done. Our product's done when it's crunchy. So it turns stiff like a piece of cardboard. You throw it away and you put a new one in. And that one pack, depending on what you're storing it in, will last you around three months. So, and it's a very inexpensive Depending product. on where you're at, right? Or what <laughs> Yeah, time exactly. It is. But like if I take a bigger one and put it in a jar, like if I take a size 67 and put it in like a 32 ounce jar, that'll last longer than three months. You yeah. know what I mean? So... Will yeah, it over? Fine. Could could that over? No, no it? it's it, it no, it just lasts longer. So it's because it maintains that humidity. It doesn't, it'll the pack will just last longer. That's all. So it never over humidifies your flower <laughs> or anything. So, but that is a good question. I mean, like those are I, perceptions that are out there. Yeah, and that's I, why we're having I, the conversation. Like, take the packs out. It's getting right. too moist. Yeah, no, will that it, doesn't happen. <laughs> will it re will it rehydrate? Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> my recommendation, I mean, like it's not going to improve if you have flour and like it tests like the potency is like 18% THC, it's not going to make it like 20%. It's just simply going to keep it from drying out. So if you do, and this happens a lot here, you'll go to a dispensary and you'll buy your flour and, it, and it's dry, you know, and you, there's all kinds of old school methods like throw an orange peel in there or something. But really, if you throw a boba pack in there, I would recommend a 62% one the higher RH, because it makes your flour so sticky. I mean, it's at the point now where I use the lower RH because it's just like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I mean, like it's, you can't even grind it. It's like, yeah, I got to smoke it somehow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do the 50%. It's already a concentrate. <laughs> but yeah, it will rehydrate your flour for sure. I can attest to that. I, yeah. I had some like oh, super dried stuff. I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I taught a tossed a boba in and I, I tried the before and after, so it really torched your throat like when it was dry. You, you put the boba pack in and actually softened it up quite a bit. You probably, I probably lost a lot of the, the trichomes just because it dried out and they kind of broke off in, in the process. But, you know, being able to to use the, the, the flour as opposed to having to waste it is, you know, is better than better than nothing. Yeah. So that's Besides how Besides losing some of those trichomes, what else are you losing in the flower as it ages as as it dries well it degradates the cannabinoids i mean like so the potency absolutely goes down you know um where what we can for sure say is that we can protect the trichomes like i fully believe it preserves potency as well but at Boveda, we're super thorough we don't stand behind claims we can't like say for sure so that's one of the ones we're actually working with uh university to test that now just to prove that so but in my experience i mean like we can't all test you know us home growers can't go out run out and get a potency test on our on our flower so you know it's kind of a challenge to do it so you know it's easier said than done in a commercial facility so so yeah, really, I just want our listeners to to really know that it's not just the responsibility of the cultivar or the manufacturer to store properly. That there's Absolutely. also the responsibility from the retail side. So that way, <clears throat> we're doing all of this work up until retail, and we're not storing it properly until the consumer gets it. What's the point? Absolutely. Um, I would say again, I would make the correlation to cigars. I mean. Yeah. You buy a cigar, you go home, you put it in your humidor because you want well, to protect and it. right? Educating right. the consumers about about the tools and, and tips and tricks that are out there too to preserve their flower. Because they might be like, I live in New Mexico right now. A lot of rural areas around here, they'll come in and, you know, pick up a few ounces. They won't come back down from the mountains or wherever they're living for months. Same thing with Colorado. Absolutely. Right. Um, Absolutely. But you're right. I mean, like, but, you know, oftentimes, especially in newer markets, you'll see that there's prepackaged flour. So, you know, um, the bud centers don't even have a choice. You know, it's yeah. like they can't go, let's throw it in there. But you're right. They can't educate the consumer to be like, hey, when you take this home, preserve it, do this, you know. They can still make sure they're doing things like not keeping it in a 90 degree room. Absolutely. A hundred percent. There's a humidifier in the storage room if they're in a, a, a super, you know, high, dry desert like me and John are. 
um, or, you know, there's, there's things that they can do that, or again, educating the consumer, like, Hey, if you're going to keep this around a little bit. So, right. totally. but, but I love that you brought this into kind of our next transition. Uh, this is a great transition into packaging and labeling. And you mentioned the States, um, that now require pre-packaging. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can do, you know, keeping, you know, clear tubs, not, uh, not keeping those in light, making sure our storage room is dark. Um, if someone's not in there, if things are in a clear tub, um, all of those things until it gets to actually putting it in the packaging that our consumer is going to get. In some states, we do that before it gets to a facility. Some states like New Mexico, retail facilities can have a manufacturing license and they can actually package their flour, buy it wholesale, package in-house. California, prepackage everything. It gets shipped out from the manufacturer. You can't even prepackage your own product as a cultivator without having that manufacturing license. So John, I know this is your wheelhouse and I'm interested in learning a little bit about, you know, just both ends of that, how you guys help with people dealing with the prepackaging, especially. Well, sure. I mean, first of all, packaging is uh, a necessary expense and it's one that can really uh, maintain the uh, vitality of your product uh, if you purchase the right kind of packaging for the product that you're uh, pushing to the market. And, and I, I can't underscore enough, what you put into the package uh, should be what comes out of the package when the retail customer comes uh, and, and finally buys that product. And, and uh, the only way to do that is to, to spend the time and energy knowing that you're putting it in the right package. I have a little bit of packaging here with me now uh, that I could show you one that has a nice seal so that the product stays uh, a little bit uh, uh, more uh, uh, fresh as it goes along the process. This going into a wholesale box that is uh, humidity controlled would be a best way to get that done. Uh, from a con concentrate standpoint, there's lots of things out there. In this case, these folks, I, I've got a little uh, concentrates here that I've been smoking on this morning and these folks still have a styrofoam liner uh, we talked a little bit about off, off gassing and when you put concentrates into a jar uh, with a uh, styrofoam liner, those two things can chemically react to each other. And so having a, a high quality program around and, and understanding how your product interacts with the packaging is really important to maintaining uh, freshness. And so I had no idea. So we commonly talk to folks about how you're going to best maintain freshness. We're using super inert materials uh, like PTFE and uh, uh, basically Teflon uh, and others that are making sure that your, your product is only interacting with itself, that your package, the inside of your package is food grade because what we are uh, selling into the marketplace here are consumables. And so making sure that your packaging is not only um, compliant with the rules, uh, but that also that it is presenting a safe product for the end consumer. And if you are preserving it properly through that process, also a quality product, which will keep that consumer coming back uh, for more of that product. Absolutely. Uh, 2014 is when I started in the, in the legal cannabis space in Colorado. I've seen a lot happening with packaging. A um, couple things I want to touch on. Child resistant. I want to talk about Mylar bags. Um, I want to talk about some of the new technologies that people are implementing in packaging, like, you know, uh, QR codes or NFC tags, right? So pick from those three. What do you want to start with? Sure. I, I keep muting my microphone and unmuting it because I've got a very oh, active, yeah, the floor is uh, uh, very, very active airport going on here at Ocean Beach. But uh, uh, I'll be there I, next week. Right on. Well, I could give you some restaurant recommendations. Oh, I sure. live in OB. I lived two houses <laughs> off of the pier for years. Oh, nice. I used to manage what's now Cow Records was Ivy's. It was like a little hippie store. Yeah, I just I bought four them. records at Cow Records. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll I'll give you a preview when you come by Dispo sometime. But uh, ASTM child resistant certification is a really simple uh, situation. Depending on where you're 
producing your packaging, whether it's here in the United States, domestically or overseas, you can find uh, folks that can support your uh, needs to have things ASTM certified uh, for child resistance. And some states require that, other states do not. Some states require you to meet the guidelines but don't need certification, others do. Uh, our company is commonly creating new products and patenting new products that have uh, ASTM certifications. So uh, if you have a need for that, it certainly can be researched online very easily, uh, or you can give us a call and we can help you navigate uh, through that process. Uh, it is not an inexpensive process, however, uh, here in the United States, uh, costing folks, you know, somewhere between eight and $12,000. Uh, I've seen it as low as a couple of thousand dollars uh, overseas. So uh, as you have every product, each size and each type of closure requires its own certification. So uh, important to understand that. Uh, I know you brought up um, Mylar bags. What were your questions about Mylar, Katie? I think there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, talk about Mylar. Some people are like, Fuck my lar bags. Some people are like, this is the only way to do it. You know, I just, what's your opinion? Well, my opinion is that uh, more than 60% of the flour that is leaving stores uh, and some of the best and most recognizable brands uh, on the planet are using uh, Mylar for storage, uh, for retail purposes and for wholesale purposes. And uh, that ultimately to get an airtight food grade option for uh, wholesale and retail packaging, it'd be hard to find a better and more sustainable product than Mylar. And I can tell you some of the reasons behind my comment on sustainability is one, Mylar can be recycled. Uh, if you do it properly, it can be serviced in a biodegradable format if you're willing to make the spend. But ultimately, most mylar is being produced overseas, as is glass jars and other plastic bottles and things that are being used for packaging. And you have to take into account the cost to move those goods uh, and the environmental impact of moving those goods. And when you move plastic bottles that do not nest and you move uh, glass jars, uh, you're moving quite a lot of air. And so uh, for our, from our standpoint, uh, sustainability is, is more of a whole picture than uh, what can or cannot be recycled. And so I, I think if you're uh, really wanting to get into an efficient process for your wholesale and retail packaging uh, and gain quite a lot on your um, footprint, your carbon footprint, Mylar might be a, a, an excellent option. Great. Put that one to rest. Good. Well, yeah. I mean, you can put it in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. And you, you had a third topic, Katie, and I can't remember what it was. I'm trying to think about it, too. Stoners. Stoners. Freaking stoners. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about changes that, you, that we've seen. So I've seen companies, you know, this was earlier in the industry. I've seen companies be affected by rule changes for packaging that have affected them I mean, even just the molds that they're, you know, making their edibles with that have affected them like $200,000 overnight. Um, yeah, and over, overnight's the biggest problem, right? I mean, we right. can we can all withstand needing to make changes. And this is why Dispo is, is incredibly active uh, and, and very actively involved in um, the, the policy revolving around compliance and packaging because we want to help our regulators understand we don't mind making changes, but I've got a six book, six month runway of products sitting here that I need to use. And so uh, that's why we maintain and, and participate as often as possible uh, in how policy is set around this. I see Matthew here uh, in the good. comments is, is asking about QR codes and, and NFC. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, we are using uh, QR codes and NFC technology for a couple of things to demonstrate testing information uh, and how your product was tested uh, and uh, additionally marketing information to be sent. And NFC, most importantly, is being used to block against counterfeiting. Uh, a lot of organizations out there are so popular that the uh, the former legacy, now black market, 
are using uh, uh, branding from uh, legitimate uh, legal Have you commercial been to New businesses. York? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I saw my, my packaging. It was such a trip. I was I was yeah. so keen from like a sixteen year old kid and 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 it was had like a California tag on it and testing stuff on it. I'm like anyone can make this. But right. I, I was I was just you can buy it right off of Alibaba. Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, so with with NFC technology, you can actually really guard against that and block against it, and and use it protect. He probably wasn't sixteen, by the way. Everybody, nobody, nobody freak out on me. Sorry, keep going. Um, so, um, in any case, that uh, uh, is what what we've been up to uh, with regard to uh, protecting brands and protecting the quality of the product as it goes into the package. This is a great question. Um, basically, you know, mason jars. What are your thoughts on curing um, the curing process through mason jars and grow bags? Anybody have an opinion on that? I like both. I mean, like, um, we're, I'm actually doing some experimenting right now with we're big on bags all of a sudden at Boveda. Uh, we're really trying like cure bags. Uh, grow bags are a great high barrier bag. Um, the one thing I will say is I think they do promote that they off gas automatically. And that's just, that's not true. Um, but <clears throat> they're a great bag to, to, you know, airtight works really way great high barrier. Like I was saying, throw a boba pack in there <laughs> and jars. I mean, like I use jars too. I use jars, turkey bags, you name it. So I'd be curious to hear what you guys think. Well, <laughs> I, uh, certainly would, would jump in. I, I think that the, the the overstated technology sometimes in in these bags, like what you were saying earlier about the, the instant <laughs> burping or things like yeah. this, is 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 just silliness. And and so, uh, like I said earlier, finding a bag that is airtight and food grade, uh, and you've got the best technology uh, out there to protect your product overpaying for that technology means that you believe in marketing but uh <laughs> and, and and i do believe in marketing and i know david you are a former uh big brand guy and and uh so i i uh, can appreciate that but getting your product into a high quality uh airtight uh space like katie says a space that's dark uh, I think that you can uh, ensure a much better product as an end result to your consumer. Yeah, and and we're container agnostic. Like we we don't we don't have a preference. We do, uh, you know, along with with John and David, agree that it's physically impossible to have a, a sealed bag that can off gas and take the gases out. That's why we created the cure pocket so that we can measure what's in there, measure the gases, measure the humidity and make a pumped actual air exchange. Um, so yeah, if you could put a hole in that bag and put a cure pocket in, we're good with it. I love it. Okay. So I know that we've got just a few more seconds here. I do want to test here on just labeling John, I've seen a lot of people make mistakes on their labeling. I think one of the biggest ones that I see is the manufacturer or the cultivator. Um, and for those of us who have a hard stop, David, I know that you you need to get going. So don't worry um, if you need to, to hop off, no problem. Um, but I've seen a lot, of a lot of people not think about on the retail side, once we get your product, we have to put a label on it ourselves to be able to work with our point of sale system. And I see a lot of people not really think about that and they'll put on, you know, maybe some required stuff that we needed from their product, but I can't use it because now where do I put my label? How do you deal with some of these challenges? How do you help your customers through that? Well, I can tell you, uh, I would be, um, as a brand, I'd be upset sometimes when I see how the dispensary has treated my brand and, and covered my marketing uh, on my, my packaging. And so ultimately I, I think that getting your labels right, uh, is important, but placing them properly is, is even more important. And so, uh, I, I think that is, uh, like Chris said much, much earlier in this conversation, I think is exactly right is educating bud tenders, um, on, on how those compliance labels would be best placed on that package, how that package would be best stored in the dispensary, uh, pre-sale. Uh, particularly if it is a prepackaged item, um, you know, 
buyer and bud tender education is, I think, maybe among the most important education to have uh, for our consumers to get the best possible product after purchase. I agree. Agreed. I absolutely agree. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. I cannot thank you enough for all of your time. We've all put a lot into this initiative. Um, a little sneak peek for you guys out there, what is coming for you with our harvest SOPs. It'll be harvest, drying, uh, packaging, storage. Oh, sorry, curing, storage, and packaging and labeling. So we're really excited to share those with you. It'll be mid-September, and we'll keep everyone out there up to date on uh, when they can get their goodies. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Thank you. much. For cannabis businesses' standard operating procedures in a binder on a high shelf collecting dust, let Katie, the SOP lady, get your SOPs out of the dark and into the digital age with buildmysop.com. Buildmysop.com offers easy to use templates and or customized SOP development to suit your business's individual needs. When you get that binder off the shelf and turn SOPs into daily procedures, you will see productivity and compliance soar. Buildmysop.com is a tool that helps your team manage tasks, communicate effectively, and be prepared for when the regulator stops by you'll find state-specific guidelines to keep your business up to date on the latest regulations and a team of experts to help you achieve your compliance goals. Go to buildmysop.com to get your standard operating procedures off the shelf and turn them into powerful tools to run your business.